you are on the journey of business. An entrepreneur and innovator who spent a lifetime of advising from behind the scenes, building businesses through word of mouth and referrals. Now Mike Wolf is ready to share these strategies and business outlook with you. You're here. You're ready for the journey of business with Mike Wolf. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the journey of business. I am Mike Wolf. My guest today is a serial entrepreneur and angel investor is taking on the venture capital world with his company, Thunder.VC. I want to welcome Jason Kirby to the show. Hey, Mike. Thanks for having me on the show today. Absolutely, man. Hey, I'm fascinated by your story. Can you tell everyone a little bit about yourself? Yeah. Started off you know, my first business in college, just passionate about wanting to learn how to start a business, pursued something I was passionate about and kind of been a wild journey with lots of ups and downs from kind of small business life to going into the, the VC back startup world and you know, having a couple exits. You know, it's been a pretty fun, wild journey with lots of lessons learned along the way on how to raise capital, how to build a successful business, how to fail quickly, how to understand when you should stop building something that isn't working. Right. And many other things. So it's been uh, it's been fun. I know so many listeners have questions about raising money for their businesses. What is an existing or startup company process like for them with your team if they jump on at thunder.vc? So if someone's looking to raise capital, the first thing is, you know, a little bit about Thunder and how it works is we use AI to determine the probability of success for the companies within the network and what's the probability of raising capital from VCs in the network and populating those scores across the entire network of 3,500 investors. When a company comes into us, we basically look at, are they venture backable? That's always the first question before we look at anything else is, you know, are you building a business that an investor can believe the story and believe the mission to where you will have potential for a billion dollar plus exit? And that's typically the requirement for most VCs when it comes to specifically raising venture capital. There are other ways to raise capital for other different types of methods. Venture happens to be the sexiest and you know sound like the coolest but it's not always the right. most appropriate avenue for most sure yeah so our process we take you in we determine if you're venture backable across a bunch of variables and then we look at you know are you attractive to the vc network that we have are there are substantial amount of vcs that would be interested in your particular business and if so we help try to facilitate those connections either with our team or you can unlock what we have kind of our founder premium access where you can take control of your own fundraising and reach out to those VCs leveraging Thunder and Thunder's AI matching scores as a basically a warm intro at scale without having to, you know, hunt down, you know, that friend of a friend of a friend to get access. Right. That's awesome. I, I, I talked to you a little bit about this earlier. You know, Shark Tank has kind of been longstanding that's kind of the go-to for people who believe that investing in businesses, that's kind of where it became more attractive, more sexy. What do you think that impact has had on VCs? And what do you think that, you know, is it is it people overvaluing their business because it's like, oh, well, Mark Cuban said this or whatever. Is there kind of a weird dichotomy there? Like, what does that look like in your opinion? Uh, I think Shark Tank has brought a lot of attention and kind of over glorification of starting a business and being a startup founder without kind of really showing the true behind the scenes of like the complexity of running a business and getting it off the ground. So it kind right. of paints a rosy, entertaining picture of, you know, in some cases a false reality, more of like an Instagram reality, not so much sure. reality. Yeah. But it's done wonders for just inspiring people to start and try and creating more opportunities and showing that people can be successful. I would say most businesses actually on Shark Tank, I would say, won't necessarily fit the mold for venture capital. They're usually small businesses. They're focusing on cash flow and you know profits from day one. They usually already are profitable in some cases, and they're taking relatively small amounts of money from you know the the sharks in those cases. Whereas venture capital, you're not dealing with. That's more of like an. I would say Shark Tank's more of like a glorified angel investing type experience. Yes. Where venture capital is institutional capital. That right. Where, you know, these VCs who, you know, most people think are these big, successful, rich people, but in reality, they're having to chase down the real rich people that are what's known as a limited partner investing into their fund and trusting them to get them, you know, 10, 20 X return on the fund. Sure. 
so it's just a completely different ball game and a lot of process and relationships and kind of diligence that has to be done before a deal can get done. When you look at Shark Tank, it's like, oh, 15 minutes and they raised a million bucks. Like, wow, that's so easy. Right. Well, having attempted to be on Shark Tank myself for my first startup, failed miserably, yeah. you know, big crash and burn. We it spent about three months applying and kind of going through a process with Shark Tank only to find out, uh, you know, we got, you know, axed right before we had the opportunity to be on the show. But, you know, it was like a th couple of months and a ton of work to kind of package up the video, create the story, right. make a business that's attractive to be on there. Sure. I think a lot of people don't see that behind the scenes. And the same with venture capital. When you're raising venture capital, you kind of have to package your business up in a way to raise capital. I think a lot of people just think they need a pitch deck and start meeting investors and they want to throw money at you. And that's not the case at all. You have to create basically your business in a packageable format that fits a certain mold and expectation of venture capitalists and then get in front of the right venture capitalists. And that's kind of what we focus on at Thunder is right. you're getting the right room with the right people. Because often just because a fund has money doesn't mean that money has any interest in you or your business. Sure. Yeah, you have to make sure that you are targeting the right people at the right time for your business at its current stage. And once you have that first meeting, it'd be three to six months before, you know, you actually receive the funds and close because it's a pretty extensive process from meeting with partners, going through due diligence, getting a term sheet, going through further diligence before yeah. you actually receive the money and all while trying to build a successful business and keep the numbers going up into the right at the same time. Sure. So that's a pretty arduous process, right? I mean, you know, it seems like from what I understand about your team, you guys narrow down this list of the best matches of the VC. So you don't open it up to 3,500 people. You say, okay, hey, this is kind of where you guys are. Tear it down to three to five to 10 VCs that you believe will be the best match for the business that are seeking your help. It, you know, what is that personal touch and the value add to those people like in their companies with that experience? I mean, because you almost kind of have to hold their hand a little bit through that experience. What What is that experience like? Is it tougher than it seems? And like you said, I mean, they're still trying to operate a business in the meantime, knowing that they need that backing. Yeah. So that's that's the, the challenge. I mean, that's kind of sure. like the, the natural filter that VCs leverage, where if you can't package your business up, to raise capital and continue to grow that business while entertaining VCs, then maybe you weren't meant to raise venture capital and should build a small business. And that's kind of right. what a lot of VCs feel. And so what we you know, kind of do is like when we, when we have a company come in, we typically want to see between 15 to a hundred matches that our AI recommends. And based on that, we'll usually narrow that down by 20, 30%, just their human screening, just kind of knowing that uh, maybe the algorithm missed something. And there's some nuances that are, you know, we don't have taken into consideration the AI. And then yeah. when it comes to like kind of a sweet target list, what happens is a lot of founders will be like, I need money. And they just kind of Google angel list or VC list and they spam them all. And, you know, in most cases, a lot of founders don't have connections. They don't have the relationships already established. They're young, right. they're a first time founder or whatever it might be. And typically, people mostly raise money from friends and family first to kind of get things off the ground. But once they try to get institutional capital, it's a different game. What it really comes down to in terms of successfully raising capital is trying to build an actual relationship with those that have the money, ironically, before you need the money. Sure. And so what we encourage founders to do when, when they come to Thunder and upgrade to premium is they can basically see like, hey, here's the 30 VCs that could change your life and give you money. Go find everything you can about them and let's try to help you build a relationship with them, either going into your fundraise or potential future fundraise. But these are the 30 people that have the highest probability of writing a check to you. So these are the ones you want to put all your effort into. 30 is a lot more manageable than a thousand. Right. And you kind of have a lot more focus and ability to create those relationships as opposed to you know, trying to make something happen. You know, last minute, a lot, a lot of founders get caught up in the last minute fundraise. Like, right. Oh, we only have two months of runway and we need money tomorrow. It's like, yeah, no one really wants to back, you know, founders that put themselves into that kind of situation. And right. so when you come to the decision that you're going to start a business and you're going to start what's considered a startup, not a small business, you need to have some kind of plan that tells you that you're going to need about six months of runway to raise capital. Sure. And you'll need ideally some kind of validation or proof 
to de-risk the investment for those investors to encourage them to participate. Yeah. As much as our investors say, we'd like to come in early. Eh, they don't like to take an obscene amount of risk. They want you to de-risk the investment as much as possible, have customers, have proof points, have technology, have something already established and a good team that can deliver you know, before they'll invest. And you want to make sure you have like a roadmap or a plan that makes sure that you'll have enough runway to get the cash. Because the last thing you want to do is at the end of your runway, start asking for money because you're going to look desperate. You're going to look like you didn't plan ahead and you're going to be, you know, kind of, a, it's going to be a deterrent for, for most venture firms. For sure. So like, just kind of piggyback on that. At what point do you believe a company should consider taking on outside money? Is it from the jump? Like, you know, when you're scaling that business in a business plan and you're looking and you're forecasting and, and like you said, you need six months of runway, no question about that. But I mean, wh- how do you know if they should jump into a VC deal or if you should say, hey, you need an angel investor or you should just hit up some family and friends and see if you can, you know, bootstrap it and get it off the ground? So when it comes to raising capital, there's different stages for different businesses. And what I try to tell people is, you know, what is your desired outcome? And that's like something as a qualifying question I ask, not through Thunder, but just anytime I'm talking to a founder, it's just like, do you want to build a billion dollar company and take on all the responsible, you know, the responsibilities and burden of doing so? Do you want a $5 million business and be very happy and successful making a half million dollars in profit every year? And is that right? You know, better? Like, in a lot of cases, small business owners are far more successful in terms of cash flow and you know profit than an income versus a tech startup founder, especially in, you know, when you think about the actual numbers and statistics. So what I tell people when it comes to raising capital, determine if you actually want the responsibility of man, you know, being responsible for other people's money. Yeah. I'm sure people always talk about get rich off other people's money, but that takes on burden. You know, that's a responsibility of fiduciary responsibility of other people. You can't just do whatever you want anymore. Sure. And so you have to kind of determine what future do you want? And based on that, what kind of resources does your business need to get to the level of success that you're hoping for? And in some cases, you can raise capital from a bank, you can raise capital from, you know, private, you know, debt funds, and these other types of high worth individuals like angels, sure to build a profitable business that is not necessarily venture scale. But if you do see that your business requires a significant amount of capital upfront to reach a large amount of scale down the road, and you're gonna be burning money and a lot of money in excess of you know millions of dollars sure. to kind of get to some kind of scale, that's where you have to kind of figure out, okay, we need a business plan and a model to raise venture capital. Things that are important to that future business, you need to have good unit economics, you need to have high gross profit margins. Yes. Because you're gonna be lighting money on fire for a long time. VCs want to know that when you hit a certain scale, that those profit margins will start coming into play. And, you know, if you had to cut costs or anything like that, you'll start making money and printing money. And that's ultimately where your business needs to go. So those are some things I kind of tell people. And then, you know, first, anytime you just, you're just an idea, the only people that are going to write you a check are friends and family. Sure. So tap into those. And if you have some traction, you have something sexy, maybe you got a good, you know, product sort of built, but you're looking now to get your first couple customers. Angel investors can be very interested in that. And I tell people to focus on, again, friends and family and friends of friends that are angels or high net individuals. Right. Once you tap that, reaching out to angels that have an expertise in your area that can have, add value sure. are much more likely to invest than just a random person with money. So those are kind of the, the tips I typically recommend for that very early you know, capital raise. And it's usually for... 50 grand to like a million bucks is typically where you'll go to yeah. friends and family and angels or, or accelerators and accelerators sure. are great opportunities for, for founders as well. That's awesome, man. That's really good feedback. I, I know that'll help a lot of people. So I wanted to shift gears a bit. You have scaled a handful of companies to raise capital in the past and then exited those companies, as you mentioned, can you share a little bit about those experiences? Yeah. So with every success, there's definitely failures. So I've definitely had my my fair share of collapses and you know, raised a couple hundred grand for one business, went to raise venture capital, could not raise capital for the life of me. And that had to do with one, it was 2013. There was not as much venture capital as there is today. I was in sure. San Diego, which is not a venture capital friendly market for tech businesses. Right. And we weren't building a business that was perceived as venture scale. And while I did not know that nor believe that at the time, 
Yeah. I, you know, so we persisted to try to raise capital, but we spent so much time wasting time trying to raise venture capital when if we probably would have just raised another 300, 400 grand from angels, we probably could have built a profitable business. Sure. And so you definitely learn from those mistakes. But then, you know, moved to New York where, you know, opportunity is plentiful. You know, joined as the, you know, first executive and really first employee of a company called Liquid Sky. You know, helped them raise about four million relatively quickly. It was a cloud gaming product. We made it possible to play any game on any device. And our journey was a wild roller coaster. It was raising that first few million, getting it off the ground, proving out the technology, proving out that the unit economics were possible, and that was a challenge. And then you know, growing to one point eight million users across 130 countries in you know, basically a year and a half was a pretty wild ride. You know, went on to raise in total 12 million from Samsung, which was a corporate venture fund. And then we had, you know, high net worth individuals was known as like family offices. So there's some well-known family offices that invested. And we basically took that money, we built out the product and scaled it. And then we got an acquisition offer from Samsung, which was like, amazing. We're all super excited. We you know, couldn't tell anyone. It was all under NDA and it was just the right. founder, me, the board and our CFO that knew what was going on. Sure. And yeah. I kid you not, the day of closing, day we're all supposed to get these nice fat checks. We got bottles of champagne at the office to celebrate and give everyone these new yeah. offers and like yeah. you know, have a great time. Well, in Korea, Samsung had a regime change and back in 2017, the CEO was arrested and the new CEO came in and that new CEO came in. His first order of business that day was to kill every deal on the table. Wow. And so our deal died that morning, uh, you know, Korean time. So we wake up at like, you know, few, you know, in the morning to a you know text that the deal is dead. So wow. that ice melted and that champagne soured, you know, <laughs> it was yeah, like pretty quick, sad. Quickly. Moment. Yeah, but then we uh, we quickly pivoted the business. We made a bunch of cuts. We raised some more capital. Went to more of a B two B model. I signed contracts with Walmart, LG, KT Telecom, Verizon, and several others to kind of more of an enterprise edge compute, edge GPU compute solution. And in doing so, we kind of positioned ourselves to successfully get uh, Walmart interested in acquiring us. They were our biggest client at the time. Yeah. That was a big win. We got acquired by Walmart about basically a year later after the Samsung deal fell apart. Sure. And, you know, got everyone, made everyone happy, got everyone, uh, you know, an exit and it was awesome. And then Walmart gave us $600 million to go build Walmart gaming. And it was like, this is awesome. This is amazing. Come on. Yeah. And, you know, I was leading the charge on the partnerships and the business side. My, you know, co-founder that you know, built the, the technology was on the technology side and we were scaling, building up the team. And then Walmart changed their mind. You know, Amazon basically came out and announced that they're like tripling down on next day delivery and same day delivery. And Walmart decided that that was a better allocation of capital. So that's where right. the money went. And we kind right. of went to what's known as the roof. If you're familiar with the TV show Silicon Valley, where they kind of banned right. their employees to the roof, that's what happened to us. We just kind of like sure. got paid, but paid to sit down, shut up and be quiet. Yeah. So that was a wild journey nonetheless. But I would say everyone was happy with the outcome, you know, considering that, you know, the, al the alternative might have been, you know, nothing. So, right. Yeah, so for sure. Out pretty well. So you mentioned that, you know, when you were on the team at Liquid Sky, you guys did get acquired by Walmart in 18, 2018. Mm -hmm. That catapulted you into this director of digital media position, right? At Walmart. That's a massive jump, right? From where you were. I mean, Walmart's kind of a monster. You know, what was that time like in your life kind of personally, right? Like when you're, when you're facing that kind of stuff, I mean, it's pretty wild, right? That seems like a wild jump. You know, I wouldn't say it would fit the normal mold of expectation because my role was explicitly focused on building Walmart entertainment and Walmart gaming. Sure. And we only had about seven months of that. So yeah. it was an accelerated experience. I was flying back and forth all over the country, hitting all kinds of gold and platinum status. I'm, <laughs> I'm sure. On my yeah. Frequent flyer miles because we had to negotiate all these big contracts with all these big publishers to announce. And we had this expectation announced on June and D3. And my sole focus was, you know, making sure our team was set up to deliver on product and make sure that we can negotiate the deals to go public with uh, when we announce. 
uh, with all the game titles and everything like that. We were working with Voodoo to merge Voodoo, which was owned by Walmart at the time, yep. into our technology as well. So you can stream videos and play video games on any device, and you can pick up exactly where you left off. So you can sure. like, literally pause a video game on your phone and then go pick it up on your TV and pick up exactly where you left off within seconds. Yeah. And whether it was a movie or anything. So we we kind of built that tech, but you know, never got to see the light of day. And you know, if it wasn't for some documents leaking, you know, maybe a year or two later, you know, none of that stuff would never have been public. Wow. So it would have just literally stayed behind the scenes. Yeah. Wow. That's crazy. So what kind of like solid takeaways did you have from that? Even though it was a short term experience, I'm sure you walked away with some kind of, you know, life lessons of going, Hey, this is what I want to do to carry on into your new venture. Well, you know, like you, uh, you know, corporate life wasn't necessarily the perfect life for me. Right. I had a lot of autonomy being the chief revenue officer at liquid sky. Basically I got to have a substantial influence over the direction of the company who we hire. And when you kind of get to the scale of Walmart, what you sacrifice for nimbleness and like being able to be, you know, agile, you kind of gain in, in like basically safety and like comfort and, you know, you know, you're going to get paid kind of stuff. Whereas like when you yeah. start up, you're like, ah, oh, we might not be able to pay ourselves in two months. Sure. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, you, I lost a lot of that control and um, autonomy, but gained, you know, the kind of comfort and safety of compensation and, you know, guaranteed paid and all that kind of stuff. So it was like a give and take. And I kind of realized that the lar- working for the largest organization in the world, yeah. you know, that's privately held or not like, you know, public company is I've learned a ton about just systems and processes and hierarchy. Uh, I met some really amazing people that I really enjoyed working with, but you know, kind of quickly learned that I, I do like to be able to move quickly, have substantial influence and, you know, have less kind of red tape and also to have my fate completely pulled out from me, you know, pull, pulled out on the rug for me without my influence at all. Like right. The decision to shut us yeah. down had nothing to do with our progress, nothing to do with what we were doing, nothing to do with our, the merit of what we built and the opportunity. It just, when you're Walmart and a, spending a hundred million dollars on something to have a 1% impact on your gross revenue, <laughs> you know, that's, more exciting and easier to do than spending 600 million on a total gamble that may or may not work. You know, it's just like the unit economics and the scale is just such a different world that learned a ton, but, you know, learned that, you know, probably maybe not the best fit for me, you know, long term. So you, you probably walked away with a ton of value there, right? I mean, you kind of, you know, almost became a little bit more self-aware of where you wanted to go, what you believed most was kind of in your calling going forward. Is that kind of what parlayed you into starting Thunder.VC with your guys? Is that you took that team, you you teamed up with the right team of people that you believed in, and then you were going to go add value to someone more in your wheelhouse? Well, what I realized is that after Walmart, I went and joined a, another startup, you know, came in early, you know, took them from, you know, relatively small team. It was like seven guys, very passion, passionate guys, but, you know, took them from 100K in revenue to 1.4 million and a quarter. Sure. Raised you know, $11 million Series A. So I got another round of hyper growth. But problem was I was in New York. They were in Kansas City. Yeah. You know, there's you know, difficulties there. So after they raised money successfully, decided to part ways. And that's kind of where what I realized is that I love startup culture. I love the kind of the venture capital ecosystem. I've had a couple of wins and successes that kind of put me in a good frame and perspective to support other uh, you know, founders. And that's kind of where I wanted to pursue Thunder is to help people with the most difficult process of building a venture backable startup. And that's typically the fundraise. Yeah. You know, it's just like packaging you, yourself up and making things, you know, coherent and cause, you know, concise and straight to the point and from the right perspective to the right audience. I just try to help founders, you know, navigate that process and try to do it at scale as well, because, you know, inherently I'd rather not build an agency, rather build a product. And that's kind of what uh, I built with uh, and why I built Thunder the way I did. Oh, that's awesome, man. That that's that's pretty an incredible journey, you know. I mean, it, I mean, it, it seems a lot of like ebbs and flows and highs and lows in that in that experience from 2013 to where you are now, 10 years later. What advice would you give to the listeners that are starting a business or are struggling currently or debating their next steps? Well, you know, something that I would say a lot of younger entrepreneurs haven't experienced yet is a recession. 
You know, yeah. I, mean, I basically built my business because it was a recession and, you know, I was in college and no one's really hiring for anything, you know, substance. So, you know, starting a business put things in my control. But I think what people have to realize, you know, if you're in a state of like struggling going into the recession, things that matter the most, I think, for businesses that are struggling is you have to have a really hard self-reflection of like, are you building something that one will bring you joy in its deepest, darkest times? Like, right. Because that's the only thing that's going to keep you going and, you know, kind of get to the, you know, the end game. And then two, are you building something that people want? Like, do you have validation? And I think a lot of founders have an idea. They have something that they think is cool or that they, you know, think will change the world or whatever it might be, but they have zero validation of that. And they haven't sure. really like gone to market with the idea yet. And they kind of keep building, 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 but never actually like, prove that this is a product to that the market yeah, wants. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's something that I challenge you know everyone to look at if just like you know if your product doesn't solve you know like pain points specifically to where people are willing to pay for it, maybe it's worth kind of reconsidering, you know, either the the business altogether or your current approach and you know whatnot. Like, you know, Slack has the famous story of like they were building a video game and it totally flopped. It was a total disaster, but they kind of learned that the internal communication chat thing that they kind of built for themselves was right. far more attractive. They built Slack. Sure. So it went from a complete failure to a $26 billion exit. So not too bad. Yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah. That, that's a good pivot for sure. Every show I talk to the guest, basically, I want their take on the return on investment of failure. What is your take on failing and how has it kind of helped you along the way? Yeah, you know, I'd say probably the the biggest shock to my system was when when I was running small businesses. So I was uh, it was in college. I launched like a photography business, doing like events, headshots for corporations. Built that up, was doing really well, traveling the world, having a blast. It was awesome. And then I launched a photography school that was extremely successful, but the largest photography school in San Diego. And then I was like, I could do anything. I you know whatever I do yeah. turns to gold. I'm amazing. Right. And so I decided to launch another business, which in this case is like a tour company, you know, concept around photography. I just I try to like force it to work without actually doing the hard work. I didn't really do it like I did my other businesses. I try to hire people before I had things figured out. Right. And I lit a lot of money on fire. Sure. Like took I lit all my profits from my other businesses on fire. And then I took on debt, you know, just thinking like, why is this not working? I should just keep, you know, basically pounding sand, essentially. Right. Yeah, it just crashed miserably and just taught me a lot. Like, okay, well, not everything I touch turns to gold. Right. I need to be a lot more calculated. I need to, sure. for me personally, and this is everyone's journeys differently. I need to be able to do something first by myself and prove it before I start hiring people and telling them what to do or delegating because if I delegate someone that's inexperienced to do something that I haven't proven, then that's just, you know, most likely a, a loop of failure. Right. And so that was like very instrumental in my career of just kind of going through that failure. And then again, like I had another failure thereafter with a company called Toggly that we raised the money for. We were growing, we built a great product. Just we still, on our wheels trying to chase money and we chased the wrong people for too long. Yeah. And instead of just focusing on the business, we wanted that sexy, we wanted to raise that $3 million seed round and be like this very successful, you know, company because raising money gives you this, you know, sex appeal and all that kind of stuff. And we just, sure. We did all the wrong things and I was able to turn all those lessons learned from running that business and raising money into a much better, more successful outcome for the next several other companies I went to. So, if I didn't have those failures, if I didn't take those chances and fail, I would not have the opportunities that I have here. I'd probably just be still running a small business, which that small business was great to me when I was 23, you know, yeah, or for maybe, sure, you know, a six figure business was amazing, but you know, it was kind of capped at that point, you know, and right. I'd, I'd be stuck there making that exact amount pretty much probably today if I was still doing it. Right. So those failures helped me kind of break out of that. Yeah, you know, mold and expand my my boundaries and reach a larger scale of opportunity that you know never would have had otherwise. So you know, I think it's really you know funny that you said that because I think it's so easy to get high on your own supply when you're winning, 
right? You know, so like when you're when your business is successful, you're like, I can take on something else. I'm killing it over here on this section. I can go over here and just do this. And and I don't think you always put as much work in the second thing because your priority is your first thing because that's where your money's at. And I think the interesting part about that, because I've experienced that in my own space where I'm like, man, I'll take this on. It'll be great. And like you said, you chase money and, you know, you, you basically wet the bed with that situation. And and even if you're winning in that business, it's still not priority one because that's not your moneymaker, at least in my experience. Like you said, I mean, I, I can't speak for everyone, but, you know, I, I think it's so good that you took on those experiences because you wouldn't be where you are without them, I would yeah, guess. Exactly. For sure. Yeah, man, I, I really appreciate you coming on today. You know, if, if you can just finally tell me where can people find you online, learn more about what you're doing and where you're going. Yeah, no, um, anyone can check us out at thunder.vc. And if anyone has questions about fundraising, raising capital, the venture ecosystem as a whole, you know, they're welcome to, you know, shoot me an email at jason at thunder.vc or hit me up on Twitter, Jason Kirby or at Jason Kirby. And then my kind of my main focus is LinkedIn. So I publish a lot of content on, on LinkedIn. Uh, you can sure. Hear my name, Jason Kirby on there and you'll find me. But always happy to, to help, you know, young entrepreneurs or any entrepreneur that's, you know, kind of looking to, you know, pursue the next step in their their business. Absolutely, man. Well, hey, thank you so much for taking the time today. I'm I'm grateful for the experience. I'm grateful for the connection, you know, because I think that there's going to be tremendous value here and hopefully we can put something together, you know, soon in the future. And and I just really appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, no, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me on and, uh, you know, look forward to seeing, you know, see what happens. Absolutely, man. Well, all right, everyone. Thank you for checking out the journey of business. We'll be back next week with another incredible guest sharing their journey. Have a great day. To continue your journey of business, subscribe to the show wherever you find podcasts or at YouTube. And for more information on consulting inquiries, go to www.tradelinksales.com.